This episode of True Crime Conversations contains discussions of allegations of violence towards children, alleged murder and adult themes. Listener discretion is advised. The sun was setting over Uluru on August the 17th, 1980, when Lindy and Michael Chamberlain put their two-month-old baby, Azaria, to bed. They were enjoying an idyllic family holiday in the Red Centre. Along with their two other children, Reagan and Aidan, the Chamberlains had travelled to one of Australia's most recognisable landmarks, and so far, their trip had been perfect. As most tourists do, the Chamberlains were camping. The closest town is 335 kilometres away in Alice Springs. After putting baby Azaria to bed, Lindy and Michael began the evening barbecue with other families that were also at the campsite. And then there was a cry or a scream. And as Lindy recalls, a flicker of a dingo running from the tent where their baby had been put to bed. The words, a dingo's got my baby, pierced through the campsite. Words that have become deeply ingrained in popular culture. It wouldn't be long before authorities began to question whether there had been a dingo at all. I'm Jessie Stevens, and this is True Crime Conversations, exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. But this won't be like most episodes, mostly because in the case of Lindy Chamberlain, there was no crime. Instead, it was one of the most significant and devastating miscarriages of justice Australia has ever seen. I'll be speaking with academic Catherine Biber, Catherine is a legal scholar, criminologist and historian and is a co-author of the book The Lindy Chamberlain Case, Nation, Law, Memory. So it was August 1980 when a family named the Chamberlains were camping at Uluru. What can you tell us about what that family was like at the time? Well, I suppose most people would today regard them as quite an ordinary family. They were a family with three young children. One of them was a very small baby. They were a family who enjoyed the outdoors. Uh, They were a family who were experienced at camping. They liked exploring Australia. And they were a family who'd lived in different places um, because Michael Chamberlain, the father, was a pastor in the Seventh-day Adventist church and had been placed in different places as a result of that practice. And so they were a family that was interested in exploring, uh, interested in Australia and interested in being outdoors. Was it popular at the time for people to go and visit Uluru? Was that kind of a popular Australian tourist destination for for people who lived in Australia? I think it was. I think it was already a place where there were campsites. It was already a place where people understood that there was a very significant spiritual importance to that place for Indigenous people. But it was also a time when people felt that the challenge to climb the rock was also something um, appealing. And so visiting Uluru and climbing the rock was something that was probably a popular attraction for non-Indigenous people. Mm. And so it was August the 17th when they put uh, Azaria, the youngest daughter, to bed in a tent. And I believe they went and were cooking a barbecue or something. And then Lindy Chamberlain and I believe Michael both said that they saw something that night. What is their version of events of of what happened that night? Well, so both Lindy and Michael gave evidence, as did other campsite witnesses, that they had seen what they perceived to be the movement of a dog or a dingo, that they had heard a baby cry. One of the campsite witnesses described it as quite a serious cry, not just a kind of insignificant gurgling sound of a baby. Um, But whatever it was, it caused Lindy to go back to the tent to check on the baby. Mm. And Michael encouraged her to go back to the tent to check on the baby. So both of them, whatever they'd perceived, either visually or through sounds, was serious enough that they both thought to go and check on the baby. So when they went to check, the baby is no longer there. Is that correct? So the evidence that was given was that Lindy looked in the bassinet or cot, the baby wasn't there and that she saw the movement that was 
the dingo and she perceived that it was carrying something in its mouth, which she immediately assumed was the baby. And that's when she said words to the effect of the dingo's got the baby. And so there were witnesses around her when she said that, weren't there? Yeah, there were campsite witnesses who were camping in the area, who were at the barbecue having a conversation with the Chamberlains and other families that were in the area. And um, in the immediate aftermath, everyone who was present all confirmed that that was what had happened. A full-scale search in the Ayers Rock area today failed to find any trace of a nine-week-old baby girl. There wasn't time to go and tell people. I just yelled out, has anyone got a torch? Lingo's got my baby. And so what ensued was a massive search to try and find the baby and see what had happened. Did any evidence show up in that sort of preliminary search? The search was conducted in the dark with torches and it was conducted in the context of local rangers being aware that dingoes had been um, coming too close to campsites and had been potentially dangerous to small children and babies. And so the search was conducted in the context of that, that it was Mm. plausible and likely that dingoes were coming too close to campsites and could be dangerous to humans. I understand that in the early stages of the search, the baby and the baby's clothing were not found. And later on, some of Azaria's clothing was found, as was her nappy and her socks or booties. And also later were found indentations on the sand where it was understood that the dingo might have put down the baby for a period before carrying her elsewhere. Also, the area was completely surrounded in dingo tracks because it was an area that many dingoes frequented. And was this something that the people who knew the area well, did that seem like a plausible explanation to them? Because as you were saying before, dingoes were in in the area. So was it possible to them that that is what had happened? Certainly amongst the rangers that worked in the precinct and certainly amongst the Indigenous people of that area, the possibility that a dingo had taken a baby was absolutely um, plausible and acceptable. And so for the first long period of time, that was the assumption that the baby had been taken by a dingo because that was something that people in the area had some kind of experience with. And so the Alice Springs coroner accepted that version of events, I believe, and that was sort of the first stage. But the story didn't end there. So the Darwin detectives kind of wanted to launch an investigation into this, which is when the sort of attack on Lindy and Michael became quite prevalent. What happened when this story started coming out and making front page news? Like what was the the new story once that original narrative had almost been abandoned? So um, this is one of the kind of difficulties of studying this case. It's um, not always clear about the decision making that occurred in the Northern Territory. So you're right, there was a first coronial inquest and it concluded that Azaria met her death when attacked by a wild dingo. And that was supposed to be the end of the story, but it's thought that there were some participants and particularly a Northern Territory detective who was not satisfied with the way that some of the evidence had been interpreted at the coronial inquest. And my understanding is that he took Azaria's jumpsuit and approached a scientific expert in the United Kingdom to see if he could come up with any alternative explanation for what happened to the baby who was wearing that jumpsuit. And the results of that scientific examination, which were conducted by a scientist called Professor Cameron, were consistent with a homicide theory. And that was when a second coronial inquest was called in order to explore whether there could be criminal explanation for Azaria's disappearance and death. After examining the baby's bloodstained clothing, Professor Cameron concluded the child's throat had been cut and said special ultraviolet fluorescent photography had revealed a small handprint in blood on the baby's jumpsuit. Did they have a suggestion of how Lindy and Michael might have done anything like that when they were in a campsite surrounded by people and the body wasn't there anymore? Like how how did they propose that it actually happened? The homicide theory required you to accept that Lindy was at a barbecue with her 
uh, family uh, and other people and had briefly left the barbecue, taken the baby to the passenger seat of the car, slit her throat with nail scissors, concealed her body in a camera bag, and that sometime later uh, she and Michael together disposed of the baby's body, even though there was no motive for any such um, actions. And all of the evidence suggested that she and he both loved this baby. It was a loved, welcomed baby and that they were both doting parents. So the homicide theory asked you to believe all of those things to what we later discovered was going to be the criminal standard beyond any reasonable doubt. That is how Azaria died. And wasn't the evidence like there was blood on the top of the jumpsuit or something? Was that the extent of the forensic evidence of of that being the story? So the jumpsuit, when it was examined by the overseas forensic specialist, was, he said, able to be viewed so that there was visible on it an adult sized blood stain of a hand. So he perceived that he could see an adult's hand stained in blood on that jumpsuit. As we might explore later, that turned out to be desert sand and there was not a handprint. After all, it was just sand Mm. appearing on the jumpsuit. But because he said that there was a bloody adult handprint on it, that's what triggered further investigation and what ultimately became a miscarriage of justice. So if that baby had been taken into the car, was there any forensic evidence there that a crime had been committed in that setting? Yeah. So what occurred later, because as you will know, there was a second coronial inquest um, that concluded that the killing of a child by a mother is not an uncommon happening and recommended that there be a criminal trial. And there was a criminal trial. And so the evidence that was presented to the trial was of many kinds, but the kind of forensic scientific evidence that you're asking did rely on the forensic analysis of Azaria's clothing and the forensic analysis of the Chamberlain's car. And evidence was presented that in the car there were stains that were consistent with having come from blood and that under the dashboard of the car there was something that was notoriously described as the arterial spray the place where Azaria's throat must have been cut, leading a, leaving a blood spray. And that was presented to the jury as the murder scene and the explanation for how Azaria died. And was it proposed that she was then buried in the, for- the surrounding areas, but they, they obviously couldn't, couldn't find the body? Yes. Yeah, so there was never any site that was suggested by the prosecution as where Azaria's body um, was buried, but it was... Um, proposed that somewhere in the broader Uluru area her body was disposed of and was never subsequently discovered. And this story became a massive uh, media spectacle because there is now, you know, obviously this accusation that a woman has killed her baby at, at Uluru. When Lindy Chamberlain had to face the media, which she did, how did she come across to people at home and to the public generally? Well, I suppose this is something that now we reflect back on and see whether it's appropriate to judge a woman's behaviour um, from her performance in the media at a moment of great crisis and tragedy. Um, I suppose, broadly speaking, there were two different perceptions of Lindy. One was that she was a grieving mother, completely distraught by the possibility that her baby had been taken and consumed by a wild animal. At two months old too, that's yes. so, so young. That's Just right. a newborn. It was a, almost a newborn baby mm. who was taken from a family that loved and wanted her. Another view was that Lindy's behaviour was a little bit cold and without obvious displays of emotion. And some people thought that that was evidence that she didn't feel anything for the loss of her baby. And other people Um, accepted that she might have grieved privately and before the cameras. You know, she was not an experienced media professional. And certainly this is at a time, this was in 1980, 1981, when we didn't have social media and none of us were experienced media professionals. So I think Lindy's behaviour before the media was most people's source of information 
about her and that that probably caused a big division. And certainly for people who have memories of this time in Australia, they would remember that this was a time when everyone discussed this case in all kinds of circumstances. This was a kind of social conversation that people would informally have with acquaintances. Um, This was widely discussed in the media as well, and that it probably did absolutely divide Australians into those who thought she'd killed her baby and those who thought that her baby had been taken by a wild dingo. People are saying that she was a spastic baby or a cretin. Others are saying that she was a sickly baby and that this was a good way to get rid of her. Why do you think people have jumped to these conclusions? Perhaps they have nothing else to do. Do you think that the general public wanted her to cry, that they felt as though they were almost owed a a display of emotion in order to fully believe that she was a grieving mother? Is that what they wanted? Look, it's probably difficult to answer because I think now, with the benefit of hindsight, we've become a lot more sophisticated in understanding human psychology and human emotions and also to being more critical of the role of the media. So there was a lot of scrutiny of the Chamberlains more generally Uh, You know, some people perceive them to be weird people. Some people perceive them to be participants in a minority religion that was not well understood. Some people questioned whether you would take a nine-week-old baby camping in Uluru. So they were very closely scrutinised. And whilst perhaps, yes, they were different from a lot of families that did appear in the Australian media, I think today we might say that they are just part of the ordinary spectrum of difference in Australian society and that there was not any one correct way that they should have behaved in the circumstances. And you brought up the religious element because they were Seventh-day Adventists and that at points was almost suggested as a motive or as a justification as to why they might have done this. How did religion play a role in, in that kind of accusation? Well, that's right. I think that there was a great deal of social ignorance in what Seventh-day Adventists believe. And um, there was a lot of scepticism about some of the tenets of that faith. And there was a lot of misunderstanding that was promulgated as information. So I think a lot of people believed that it was some kind of satanic baby killing cult, which is absolutely not correct. And that, you know, adherents of that faith were more likely somehow to kill their baby as some kind of gift to God, um, all of which has been absolutely discredited, but that people were very willing to grasp onto some of these false allegations and trade in them as somehow assisting the prosecution theory that this was the kind of person who's killed a baby. And what did they make of Michael? Because it feels like, looking back on it, that Lindy was so much at at the centre and her response was analysed and dissected at length. How did Michael come across? Well, I suppose to a different degree, Michael was also scrutinised and judged for his behaviour. He also didn't show public displays of emotion. Also, Michael was a very enthusiastic photographer. And so he photographed a lot of things. And I think there was a view that that was pretty weird as well. I mean, today we walk around with uh, phone cameras and photograph everything and that's an everyday occurrence. But at that time, documenting things with a camera was thought to be pretty weird. And also there were items found in searches of the Chamberlain's house that were later scrutinised and thought to be weird. So for example, in his work as a minister in the Seventh-day Adventist church, one of his missions was to end people's smoking. And he had this miniature little coffin that he used um, in his sermons um, to kind of indicate, you know, the harm that would come to you if you continued to smoke. So that miniature coffin was later used as evidence that, you know, these were people who were preparing to kill a baby and put it in this miniature coffin. So I think people were very willing to grasp onto um, ideas and theories that ended up being absolutely benign and innocent, but wanted to find some evidence that these are weird, baby-killing, cultish people who deserve punishment. Mm. And given the lack of evidence, why was it that that the theory went that Lindy had actually committed the crime and that she'd been the one who had killed the baby and then it was believed he was sort of an accomplice? Why, why was the focus so much on Lindy? Was there any forensic evidence? Well... I mean, there was forensic evidence presented. It all later turned out to be bad science. 
The charge was that she had killed the baby and he was also charged as an accessory after the fact that he had participated in the concealing or burial of the baby's body. So they were both charged with crimes, but she was obviously charged with um, the homicide and it wasn't alleged that he was part of any kind of plan to kill the baby. So uh, she was charged with a much more serious crime, but they were both defendants at that trial. I'm interested in in how the scientific evidence was somehow so compelling that they could actually find her guilty of that. And obviously it was wrong, but were there any sort of fingerprints on um, the jumps? Well, there would have been anyway, but even in the car, like why was it more compelling that she would have done it than him? Well, because she was the one who left the barbecue right. for a brief period of time. So, okay. And in that brief period of time, it was alleged that she got the baby, took it to the car, slit its throat with a pair of nail scissors, hid it in a camera bag and came back to the barbecue and said, the dingo's got my baby that all of those things might have happened. So she was on that theory, the homicide theory, the only one with the opportunity to do the killing in that narrow right. window of time yes. with that very implausible method. And was that story perpetuated too by the media? Did the media take a side? It's difficult to generalise about the media because I think, and Lindy would probably agree with this, there were large elements of what you might call the women's press who supported her and understood that she was a mother who's lost her baby and in whatever circumstances she lost her baby, that's a tragedy for a woman. And so she received a lot of support from women's media. I think it's also probably necessary to distinguish media portrayals in the Northern Territory from media portrayals elsewhere, which even today I think we think of the Northern Territory as having quite, you know, salacious media reportage and a quite sensationalist style. But certainly amongst the tabloid press, there was a, a huge amount of fascination for this story. It had a lot of elements that were fascinating and great media fodder. And whilst there certainly were journalists who championed the Chamberlains and supported the Chamberlains right throughout, um, there were others who really just wanted to bring attention to every new theory in order to sell newspapers as the media was dominated by at the time. And so when she was convicted, and I believe that was in 1982 when she was convicted by a jury, what was her sentence? What did they sentence her to? Well, she was sentenced to a, a life term and so she immediately went to Berrimah Prison in Darwin. And she gave birth very soon after, didn't she? Yeah, so she was pregnant throughout her trial and she gave birth relatively soon after entering prison and very shortly afterwards that baby was taken away from her, wasn't able to stay with her and she wasn't able to breastfeed her baby, she wasn't able to care for the baby and the baby was cared for by others until ultimately she was released from prison. And do we know what those years in prison were like for Lindy? Because now she's got three children on the outside. What was she treated like? Because the law had found her guilty of killing her baby, which is understood to be one of the worst things you could possibly do. So do we know anything about her treatment? Well, she's written an autobiography, which does talk about her time in prison. I think, again, probably difficult to generalise, but I think broadly she was accepted as a member of the prison population. She worked hard. She used that time productively. She was regarded as a supportive member of the prison population. She provided a lot of support for other women and other women provided support for her. Um, and so whilst, of course, it was an absolute upheaval to their lives that she was in prison, I think probably she experienced it as a time of receiving some support for others and providing support for others. It's also probably important to mention that Lindy received a huge number of letters from members of the public. She received them prior to the trial, during the trial, during her term of imprisonment and continues to receive letters. She would estimate that she probably has received 40,000 letters, but probably 20,000 around this time. And these were, you know, hard copy, handwritten letters on paper. And so she also would have spent some of her time in prison reading her letters. Now, in 1986, an English tourist named David Brett fell to his death while climbing Uluru. And there was an enormous search for his remains. And in that process, a jacket belonging to a baby was found. What was the significance of that jacket? The jacket, when it was found, could have provided an explanation that Lindy had been providing all along 
from the, before the first coronial inquest and all through the trial was that when Azaria was put to bed, she was wearing a knitted, what she described as a matinee jacket, kind of like a cardigan. And that when the jumpsuit had been forensically examined, it didn't contain a lot of the it did, well, it didn't really contain very much dingo saliva, um, but nor did it contain a great deal of blood. So um, she said that while well, Azaria had been wearing another garment and that garment, if found, could provide some of the other evidence that was not available at the trial. So when the matinee jacket was found, if it was Azaria's and could be forensically examined, it might provide explanations that were not available at the earlier coronial inquests or at the trial. And new evidence, from my very limited legal understanding, means that you can reopen a case. Is that true? Well, yes. In in this case, firstly, it needed to be demonstrated that it was Azaria's matinee jacket and that it could be subjected to further testing. Again, there are different theories espoused about whether when it was found it was just going to be quietly hidden away Um, and actually the Chamberlain's lawyers were given a tip that it had been found and had to make their own public request for its production because otherwise it could have easily been concealed and we would never know that it had Mm. been discovered. And you know the Chamberlain story is filled with all of these kinds of tip-offs and um, attempts to conceal things and purported secrecies and the discovery of the matinee jacket is another one of them. So in this instance, because of the extremely high level of public scrutiny, as soon as the matinee jacket was found, the Northern Territory government and also the Commonwealth government issued a call for a special inquiry, which was held as a royal commission into the Chamberlain convictions. Also, at that time, the administrator of the Northern Territory ordered Lindy's release from prison on a licence. So essentially, she was released from prison pending further um, findings. And those findings in this case were to be done through a special commission of inquiry, which we now know as the Chamberlain Royal Commission. Lindy Chamberlain has been released from Darwin Jail and she won't be going back. At the same time, the Northern Territory Government has announced there'll be a new inquiry into the Chamberlain case. And what was found on the jacket? Was there forensic evidence found that that could sort of exonerate her? Well, so the Royal Commission, as with other Royal Commissions, is given broad powers to investigate the answer to a question. So the Royal Commission was not only held to examine the matinee jacket, but to examine all of the evidence, including new evidence, about their convictions and whether their convictions are safe in light of all of the evidence. So yes, the the matinee jacket was forensically examined and it provided some support for the dingo explanation. Mm. It didn't provide support for the homicide theory, but also all of the other scientific evidence that had been presented earlier, including at the trial, was re-examined. And that proved to be extremely important, um, partly because, for instance, the arterial blood spray in the car was able to be re-examined. And it was found that whilst it did contain iron, which is present in blood, um, it was actually part of the car's manufacturing process. It was a kind of spray that had been applied as a kind of sound insulation for the car. And that also contained iron. So what was thought to be an arterial blood spray turned out to be just a part of the car's manufacture. And that was one of many instances where the scientific evidence that was presented at trial when re-examined turned out not to prove what it had been proffered for in the first place. And so whilst the Royal Commission found in light of the new evidence that there was not sufficient material to support their convictions, it also led to a massive transformation in Australian forensic science. Consequently, the Territory's administrator today signed papers officially pardoning them. It's great to be pardoned for something you haven't done. As it is, convictions stand. The battle now is to wipe away the years of hate and suspicion against the mother who cried, Dingo's got the baby. In 
retrospect, it can feel almost like a conspiracy um, because that's so obvious, the explanation that you have for the, for the car. And so looking back, do you think that that's possible, that there are a lot of people who, who needed this to almost be the fault of the mother because the dingo explanation probably wasn't so great for tourism at the time? Does it feel as though a lot of that was intentional? It's difficult to know with hindsight. Certainly Lindy has her own views about what went wrong because probably there was a a moment where something turned and everything else unleashed from Mm. that point. It's important to remember that this is also around the time when the Northern Territory was arguing for self-government. And so a big part of what happened here was the Northern Territory trying to assert its own seriousness and its own capacity to administer its own affairs. There were probably also specific individual personalities that were pushing for a crime explanation in this case. And in retrospect, maybe there should have been more scrutiny applied to some of those individuals and whether they were overstating the strength of the evidence in certain circumstances. I think probably a lot of people professionally certainly in the legal profession, have reflected very closely, either on their own involvement or on the legal profession's involvement. I think probably there was broad reflection in the forensic science community as well. Whether that's been also the case in the policing community, I'm not sure. But certainly today we would say that a lot of lessons have been learned from the miscarriage of justice in the Chamberlain case. Mm, And what looks like a, you know, such limited evidence and to string that series of events just doesn't look plausible from from the outside. And so when they did assess all of that evidence and they've gone, this woman, we believe that this woman's baby was taken by a dingo, what happened next? So she was obviously released from prison. Did she receive any compensation? Was there an apology? What happened? Okay. So the Royal Commission concluded in light of the new evidence that the convictions were not safe. That's all that it concluded. It didn't conclude that the dingo had taken the baby. So after the Royal Commission, the Chamberlains went back to the Northern Territory Court of Criminal Appeal, which in light of the conclusion of the Royal Commission said all of the evidence does not support the underlying conviction for murder. And so they actually took quite an unusual step and declared them to be innocent. It's normally not the job of a court to declare someone innocent. Mm. They either say guilty or not guilty. But in this case, the Northern Territory Court of Criminal Appeal kind of um, ratified the finding of the Royal Commission, which has a different role, and declared the Chamberlains to be innocent. As a result of that, the Chamberlains wanted Azaria's death certificate to be amended because the death certificate had provided different explanations for Azaria's death as each of these legal processes had concluded. So there was a third coroner's inquest, which concluded that the cause and manner of her death were unknown. And that was very frustrating, of course, for the Chamberlain family, but more broadly, because the Royal Commission, which has a very specific role, said, look, there's not enough evidence to support the homicide explanation, but there's also not sufficient evidence to explain what happened to Azaria, partly because of the passage of time partly because her body was never recovered, but also, and this is important, um, when the Royal Commission was doing its scientific analysis of the evidence, it turned out that a lot of the material that had been forensically examined for the trial had been all used up in that process and there was nothing left for the Royal Commission to examine. So tiny traces that might have appeared on the jumpsuit were all used up by the forensic scientists giving evidence at the trial and, and many of those people also had not kept notes or records or photographs of what they had done. So when the Royal Commission came along, they couldn't redo those tests because there was nothing left to to test. So the Royal Commission was frustrated by that now bad scientific practice of using up everything and not keeping records of the results or photographing, you know, when a test changes colour, you know, to capture that moment. Um, So the Royal Commission was unable to conclude that she was killed by a dingo. So the third coronial inquest also left the cause and manner of her death as unknown. And after that, the Chamberlains did receive compensation. It was not a large amount. I don't want people to think that they were enriched by this. Absolutely not. 
They were compensated because their car had never been returned. So they were given a small amount of money to compensate them for the car. And Lindy and Michael each received small separate amounts of compensation for the miscarriage of justice. And also there was some money given to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which had provided funds to support both the scientific and legal processes that the Chamberlains had relied upon. So there was a small amount of compensation offered. The Chamberlains also sought an apology from the Northern Territory government, and to date that has not been provided. Really? And then in 2012, there was a fourth and final coronial inquest because the Chamberlains were not satisfied that Azaria's death certificate should record the cause and manner of her death as unknown. And so the fourth and final coronial inquest concluded that Azaria had been killed by a wild dingo. And so is that now on her death certificate? Yes. The death certificate has been amended and you can see photographs of Lindy um, holding that up for the cameras as her understanding that this is as much as she's going to get in terms of justice. In considering now all of the evidence, I am satisfied that the evidence is sufficiently adequate, clear, and that the evidence excludes all other reasonable possibilities to find that what occurred on the 17th of August 1980 was that shortly after Mrs Chamberlain placed Azaria in the tent, a dingo or dingoes entered the tent, took Azaria and carried and dragged her from the immediate area. Azaria was not seen again, despite the large search by many at the campsite. A coronial inquiry shall, if possible, find the cause of death. As Azaria was never found, it is not possible to find the terminal cause or mode of her passing. However, Justice McClemens in Re Malcolm Re Inglis said, I think that where the Coroner's Act speaks of the cause of death, it means the real cause of death, namely the disease, the injury or complication, not the mode of dying, as for example, heart failure or asphyxia. The formal findings as required by the Act that I make are, the name of the deceased was Azaria Chantel Lauren Chamberlain, born in Mount Isa, Queensland, on the 11th of June, 1980. She was the daughter of Michael Lee Chamberlain and Alice Lynn Chamberlain. Azaria Chamberlain died at Uluru, then known as Ayers Rock, on the 17th of August, 1980. The cause of her death was as the result of being attacked and taken by a dingo. Mrs Chamberlain Crichton, Mr Chamberlain, Aidan, and your extended families. Please accept my sincere sympathy on the death of your special and loved daughter and sister, Azaria. I'm so sorry for your loss. Time does not remove the pain and sadness of the death of a child. At the same time that I have released these findings, I have made a copy available to the Office of Births, Deaths and Marriages. Should you now wish to attend their office directly behind the court building, a certificate of death will be available to each of you, which reflects the findings that I have made today. So this story is one that is obviously, we've seen two parents that would have been mourning their newborn baby. It's an absolute tragedy. And yet, culturally, not just in Australia, but around the world, uh, the story of Linda Cha- Lindy Chamberlain has become almost a punchline. Like, a dingo stole my baby has become something you might hear in a, a comedy. Why has that happened? Why is it that the gravity and the seriousness of this crime sort of never really penetrated the culture? Look, that's probably a difficult question for me to answer. I'm a law professor <laughs> and not a... Uh, Social scientist, I think probably this story captured a lot of very ugly aspects of Australian society. And I think we should probably reflect on that now. The idea that it can be the subject of jokes. You know, there were T-shirts and tea towels that were manufactured during the trial that showed, you know, a dingo carrying a bloodstained pair of scissors Um, A lot of those items are now held in the National Museum of Australia to kind of record not only the case as an important historical event, but also the really ugly side of Australian popular culture, that people didn't pause to 
reflect on the fact that this is a grieving family that's lost a baby. This is not fodder for a media spectacle. This is not something we should all be joking about. This is actually a very personal family tragedy. It almost feels like now we talk about the internet pile on and how people jump jump on someone who, you know, might be innocent or not. It, it almost feels like that, but before it's time. This was almost like the first, we, we look at it as a quintessential example of everyone believing that because of the way someone looked or responded to a tragedy, it, it meant they were guilty, which is, you know, not something that we ever have the right to do really. And I'm wondering that with all the work you've done on this case, and there's obviously so many lessons, uh, why do you think that this story is still so important that, that people remember the outcome and they remember the human at the centre of it? This is probably one of, one of Australia's most notorious miscarriages of justice. There are miscarriages of justice all the time in Australia and, you know, particularly Indigenous people will experience miscarriages of justice um, even continuing now. But for whatever reason, the miscarriage of justice experienced by Lindy Chamberlain has captured our imagination and captured our attention. You know, this is a story about a white woman in the desert landscape who's lost a baby in a way that probably most of us can't really imagine. There is large army of scientists. There is also scepticism about her religion. The way she and her husband behave before the media might not be consistent with the way other people might behave. So I think all of these different elements, and there are also others, probably mean that this case is very memorable, but should be remembered for its correct legacy, which is that it was a miscarriage of justice and that we should learn to do better next time. Mm. And it's a real pertinent uh, reminder, I think, that that when you're watching someone, you just don't know how they're going to respond to grief. And I think we've seen that a lot with parents and whether or not we decide that they're guilty just by looking at them. But we don't know how we'd respond in that situation, whether you'd cry on cue or or whether you might be someone who's just a little bit more private. And looking back at that footage of her, just because we couldn't see a tortured woman straight in front of us didn't mean that she wasn't having her own, obviously, grieving enormously. That's right. But also, and this is something we haven't talked about, but the, in the letters to Lindy, as I mentioned, there were a huge volume of letters and they were written by all different kinds of people, not all of them supporters of her, but a huge number of women who had lost children wrote to Lindy, identifying with her. And so whilst we now talk about the legacy as being what we perceived in the media, these were all people who individually and privately wrote to her and she kept all of those letters and all of those letters are now in the National Library of Australia. And actually some of the people who wrote the letters might be surprised to know that she kept all the letters and Mm. that they are in the National Library. But they contain a whole other narrative of how Australians felt about the Chamberlains. So people who were from um, minority religions, people who felt that they'd been victims of miscarriages of justice, people in prison, people who knew scientific things about dingoes or about uh, people who were campsite witnesses who the Chamberlains did not know were camping at the time, but also a large number of mothers who some of many of whom had lost their baby in different circumstances, but many of whom were just identifying with her as a mother. So I think that's also an important legacy of this case. And that is why Lindy has put all those letters in a national collecting institution so that Australians can also see that there was another side to how this story was understood. And that was by the huge number of people who wrote to her. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. The Crown had always said, it's Lindy or a dingo, but they wouldn't say it was a dingo. And so always in people's minds, it was like, well, we heard all this stuff, something smoky, so, you know, maybe she had good lawyers, maybe there was something. And dingoes, who knows that they're dangerous? The horrific story is that a woman is not believed because she doesn't look like the anguished mother or what we think the anguished mother should look like. If I smiled, I was belittling my daughter's death. If I cried, I was acting. The point is, until you go through something, you have no idea how you yourself will react. And I had no idea how I'd react until it happened to me. And people say to you, would would you change the way you came across on television? 
Well, given what I knew then and what I was going through, no, I wouldn't. I did the best I could with what I had. For photos, court documents and extra reading on this case, don't forget to join our closed Facebook group. Just search True Crime Conversations on Facebook. You can also contact the show by emailing truecrime at mamamia.com.au. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Jessie Stevens, and produced by Elise Cooper.